Aya mahit Jumelanta nbonani ninja ni molyo ni afsheni tobe landa Iye wea With a CSL May June 2023 I'm not saying I'm just saying that this question may come back to the examination And you will be required to write And to pass <laughs> So let's start with the examination <laughs> um, uh, Let's start with the examination <laughs> <laughs> okay, which question should we start with? We should start with the majoritarian dilemma or multi-party government democracy or we start with public protector or we start with a, a local government. Which one? Eh? Okay, let's start with a... Yeah, let's start with question number three. No, it's like question... This, this question number three is like... A, yeah, it has that thing, you know. It says that uh, sanctionedly, uh, clearly, explain why judicial independence is indispensable or necessary to a constitutional state. So the question is asking uh, why judicial independence is necessary uh, in a constitutional state. That's what the question is all about. So let's answer this question without any wasting of our time. You know that this is the only place where you you will pass by force, because I will always tell you every uh, how to 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 answer the examination. So let's start. Let's start. Well, to be honest, in the examination you will need this document. You will really need this document in the examination. So it's very much important that you have this kind of a document. Uh, if you need this document or you need to be my friend, you know, you know what to do. You must WhatsApp zero six one nine eight four two one three five. Uh, remember, nothing for Mahara is a national anthem <laughs> in a law. In a law, it's a national anthem. Even if you become attorney or or, or advocate, you will understand that nothing for Mahara is just a national anthem. Uh, so let's go back to the business of the day. Judicial independence is the idea that the judiciary, the branch uh, of government that interprets and applies the law, should be independent from the other branches of government. Moreover, that the judiciary should not be subject to improper influence from powerful people and entities. Whether they be individuals in government or private persons, the Constitution establishes an independent judiciary in South Africa, which is subject only to the Constitution and the law. The judiciary must apply impartially, without fear, favor, or prejudice. <laughs> okay, let's go. Let's go forward. Let's go forward, my people. This is very, this is very, very good. Yeah, now I mean, I do videos and videos and you guys don't even say. I'm saying, I'm sending this to thank you, man. So, yeah. So, let's go to the, let's talk about judicial independence and impartiality. So, number one, you must know that the judicial independence should start from the appointing of judges. That's number one. It should start from the appointing of judges. Then we have here the independence of the judiciary is a distinctive feature of the constitutional democracy and blah, 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 blah. But... That is not what uh, uh, many, you must know that it started from there, and there is a, a, a constitution. Uh, as a compromise between the need to ensure judicial independence and the democratic legacy of judges, the constitution created the Judicial Service Commission, JSC, okay, in terms of section 179, right? <laughs> I hope you can remember the JSC, right? The JSC is involved in the appointment of all judges of constitutional court, the Supreme Court of Appeal, and the higher courts. They are all uh, uh, appointed by, uh, by the recommendation of the JSC. However, don't forget that President is the one that appoints. When considering the matter of appointment of judges, the JSC is composed as follows. Then this is the, the composement of a JSC which has nothing to do with the question that you are going to answer. But you must know that, uh, you have to know that the appointment is based on the JSC. 
Then when a vacancy occurs on a court, the Chief Justice as chairperson of the JSC calls for nominations to fill the vacancy. The shortlisted candidates are then interviewed in an open interviews, which members of the public and the media are free to attend. The JSC then makes a recommendation to the president on which candidate to appoint. Any appropriately qualified person who is fit and proper person. You know, when we talk about fit and proper person, you will learn much when you are doing the... What do we call that, Moedin? L-J-U? What, what do you think? L-J-U what? Uh, what do you call that? The, what do you call that, Moedin? The, 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 oh, I forgot. L-J-U-4801 uh, or 4802. Yeah, you will learn. You will learn about it. Learn. Let me, let me just not talk much about the fit and proper person. Uh, additionally, any person to be appointed to the constitutional court must be South African citizen. So uh, judges must be from South Africa. Even lawyers and advocates must be from South Africa. So if you are out, you're from outside, when judicial, are appoint, are appoint, when judicial officers are appointed, the need for the judiciary to reflect broadly the racial and gender composition of South Africa must be considered. This is very important. So there must be a gender equity, right? Gender equity must be considered. So it's something that you must write when you are writing for that 15 marks, that the appointment of judges must consider the gender equity, that they should be a women. Like uh, Maya, you know about Maya? Maya is becoming the first woman to be the chief justice. This August. This is phenomenal achievement for women. Clap your hands for them. <laughs> oh, you don't know, you do not know about Maya? Oh my gosh. When judicial officers appointed, the need for the judicial to reflect broadly and racial. The requirement certainly applies to the consideration of the JSC, but may arguably also apply to the president in his exercise of discretion to appoint candidates recommended to him. Yeah, we're talking about Judge Mark. Then we'll come to the case of uh, Helen Sussman. Of course, it should be Helen Sussman Foundation. This is Judicial Service Commission, JSC. This case, because this case was decided on 2018. It's uh, not far from uh, uh, today, 2024. It says that the fact of the case in October 2012, the JSC took a decision to advise President, of course, Jacob Zuma to appoint certain candidates as judges of the Western Cape Division of the High Court and not to appoint others. The decision fo fo followed the public interview of the candidates and the subsequent private deliberations of the JSC. JSC. The Helen Sussman Foundation approached the High Court seeking to have that decision reviewed and set aside on the grounds that it was unlawful and irrational. <laughs> Let's hear what transpired. Rule 53 of the Uniform Rules of Court. Do you know about the Uniform Rules of Court? You do not know about the Uniform Rules of Court? Willie. Okay, let's go forward. You'll know if you are, want to be a lawyer, a serious lawyer, you will do a research about this one. It's the rule that is usually used when a party wants to have a decision of an administrator or administrative body set aside by a court. The Ellen Sussman Foundation brought its application in terms of this rule. In terms of Rule 53, of the JSC was required to file it at court the record of the proceedings sought to be uh, corrected or set aside. The record filled with the JSC, however, did not include any minutes or transcripts of the JSC deliberations. Uh, HSF uh, Sussman became aware that the JSC routine recorded deliberations and that the deliberations in question had also been recorded. It requested that the JS files the recordings on the basis that they formed part of the Rule 53 record. The JSC refused, claiming that the deliberation of the JSC are done in closed section for reasons of confidentiality. HSF brought this application to compel the JSC to file a gal record of the decision, including a recording of the deliberations. 
judgment. Let's go to the judgment. The purpose of the Rule 53 record is to operate in favor of applicant in review proceeding and ensure the review proceedings are not launched in dark. It enables the applicant and the court to properly assess the lawfulness of the decision-making process. Rule 53 record contains all information relevant to the decision or proceedings which are subject of the review. Information is considered relevant if it throws light on the decision-making process and explains what factors were likely to be taken into account by decision-makers. There is no reason why deliberations of administrative bodies in general should be shielded from disclosure in Rule 53 record. Then, there it was, the judgment. You will read this one, if only if you can become a friend, then you will have access to this doc beautiful document. <laughs> yeah, I call it a beautiful document. It's, 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 a, it's a beautiful document, you know. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a standard document. No, it's a useful document. Yeah. I. Ish. And then we are talking about judicial uh, independence and why it's important. Okay. Then number two. We have a security of a tenure and financial security. Another mechanism by which the Constitution protects the independence of the judicial. So now we are talking about the security and tenure of financial security of the judges, which is another a mechanism by which Constitution protects the independence of judicial. Right? Judges are either appointed for a fixed term or appointed on a permanent basis until they reach a fixed retirement age. Woo -wee! It's good to be a judge, eh? <laughs> the Constitutional Court hold office for a non-renewable term of 12 years until they reach the age of 70. Wow! Imagine if I can be a judge now. I have to retire when I'm 70. <laughs> Whoa, that's nice. Whichever occurs first. The Constitution allows for an act of Parliament to extend the terms of office of judge of a judge on the Constitutional Court. Uh, Parliament passed Section Four, blah 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 blah. Then, if you need more, you just request for the document. I can't read everything, guys. And then we are heading to the party that allow me impartiality. Yes, a further fundamental aspect of judicial independence is impartiality. The idea that judges should interpret and apply the law with minds open to arguments and free of bias. When hearing a matter, a judge should not have already decided the outcome before he hears each side. <laughs> this principle is placed under threat if judges take their own personal allegiances, whether they, are for they, they be political, religious, ethnic, or arising from some other sources into account when adjudicated a matter. Now we have the best cases, first case of judicial of impartiality. The case of Van Ruyen illustrates the importance of principle of the principle of independence and impartiality in our law and establishes the test for the impart, impartiality of judicial officers. Okay, let, let's check let's check what transpired in this uh, Van Van Ruyen case. Okay, Van Ruyen was convicted in the magistrate court for the theft and the unlawful possession of firearm and ammunition. So this case is a, is a criminal one, right? And sentenced to imprisonment for a total period of six years. Van Royen appealed his conviction and sentence to the High Court. One of the grounds of his appeal was that the magistrate court lacks the institutional independence required by the Constitution. Two other accused brought similar proceedings in the High Court seeking to have criminal processes against them set aside on the grounds of the magistrate court's lake independency. This matter were consolidated in this application. So if you want to read more about this case, this is SS versus others from Royan and others. Okay, This is the full case if you need it. All right. Or you can actually request my document. <laughs>
Much of the complaint related to the provisions of the Magistrate Act that created the Magistrate Commission, a body that played a significant role in the appointment and promotion of magistrate and any disciplinary action to be taken against them. It also played a part in determining blah, 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 blah. Via on wrong contention, blah, 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 blah. Then let's go to the judgment. Judicial independence and impartiality are enriched in the Constitution. Section 165, subsection 2 provides that the courts are independent and subject only to the Constitution and the law, which they must apply impartially and without fear, favor, or prejudice. Judicial independence and impartiality are also implicit in the rule of law, which is foundational to the Constitution and in the separation of powers demanded by the Constitution. Wow! What a lovely judgment. Wow! This is nice. This is super nice. Imagine if you are writing that, 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 that examination and you refer to this ex a, a judgment of the Van Royen. Wow! This is nice, right? <laughs> it's nice, right? <laughs> okay. And then when we go down to finish, it was decided that in general, the provisions of the Magistrate Act are consistent with the constitutional value of independence, judicial independence. Uh, there is no objective reason to believe that magistrate will not administer judicial independently and impartial. On an application of the test, then the magistrate in the criminal proceedings concerned were impartial and independent. Thus, the applications to set aside the criminal proceedings that gave rise to this application are dismissed. Dismissed. If you want to read more, you can refer to that case of Van Royen or you request my document. Let me repeat again, right? I told you that you can WhatsApp me on 061-984-2135, but nothing for Mahara is a national anthem. It's a national anthem. <laughs> national anthem. Let me answer this. Then we are going to the test in South Africa uh, to determine the bias. So this was decided in the case of Safru, South African Rugby, if you know this case. It's there on your constitutional book. It is not in doubt that the prevailing test for determining bias or apprehended bias in modern South African constitutional education was enunciated by the Constitutional Court two decades ago in Safru 2. It is also not in doubt that the question is whether the reasonable, objective, and informed person would, on the correct facts, reasonably apprehend that the respondent has not brought or will not bring an impartial mind. That is a mind open to a persuasion by evidence and the submission of cancer to bear on the adjudication of the case. The test was considered and developed by the same court in uh, Skow v. Ivin and uh, Jones Johnson, uh, the Supreme Court of uh, sorry, let's go down. Appeal in S v. Sechwell, S v. Bube, uh, Rogan, Moraudi, Old Mutual. It was also extensively considered and applied in at least two recent judgments of the High Court. Namely, S. V. Rungano, Sisani. In sum, the test involves a double reasonableness approach, which entails that the apprehension must be reasonable and that the person apprehending the bias also be reasonable. Since the recent recusal cases emanating from South African jurisdiction are discussed in detail as well, it is suffices to illustrate the application of the test with three cases as follows. The recusal application in Green Willow Properties v. Rogala Investment Company was based on the ground that the judge, in refusing the application for absolution from this instance, made a conclusive finding before the end of the trial. It was held that it was true that the judge made certain findings in the judgment on the application for absolution from the instance, but during the debate, with counsel, she explained that she could change her findings if evidence was led that could persuade her otherwise. 
The Supreme Court of Appeal held that this suggested that the judge was still open for to persuasion despite expressing preliminary views on the issue. Accordingly, there was no bias, no basis to find that there was a reasonable apprehension of a bias in the circumstances of the case. The Labour Court in blah 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 food. Uh, yo, those cases, those cases now are starting to be many. You know, they're starting to be many. Yeah. They're starting to be many. Mm, they're starting to be many. Okay, let me go and read somewhere. Now, the cases are starting to be. So, in brief, we can say that the independence of the judiciary in democratic South Africa is protected in numbers of ways. First, from a historical perspective, the decision to create the Constitutional Court and to entrust it with the enforcement of Supreme Constitution was a decisive aim at increasing the independence and legitimacy of the judicial following apartheid, during which the institution's legitimacy was demonstrably eroded in the eyes of the majority of South Africans. Second, our courts have interpreted the concept of independence as a pattern to the judiciary as a compri comprising two ideals, namely impartiality and freedom from external uh, interference. The extent to which the judiciary may be said to be independent, therefore, depends on the extent to which these ideas are manifestly protected and affirmed by other branches of government. Impartiality requires that the judges approach their adjudicative task with an open and unbiased mind and that they suspend to the be of their ability the influence of their own ideology and political commitments when interpreting and applying the law. Impartial adj adjudication is indirectly self-guided by the rigorous selection and interview processes that guide the appointment of prospective judges. The involvement of the JSC in the appointment of all judges in the Constitutional Court, Supreme Court of Appeal and High Courts protect impartiality by reducing the risk that judges will be appointed based on the partisan political interest. Nevertheless, it bears mentioning that impartiality in this sense is difficult to guarantee since whatever structural safeguards are in place. The responsibility tied to judicial impartiality is one that ultimately falls to individual judges to exercise. As the Constitutional Court in Safri affirmed it, must never be forgotten that an impartial judge is fundamental prerequisite for a fair trial. The second ideal related, related to the independence of the judicial, namely freedom from external interference, is secured through various means. The first is Security of tenor, that, that is uh, the guarantee that the judges will not be dismissed from office. Um, Section 176 of the Constitution guarantees that both Constitutional Court judges and judges for, uh, on the SC, uh, uh, Supreme Court of Appeal and High Court hold office for a specific time period irrespective of political counter pressure. Note that early retirement is no matter of security tenor. Second, freedom from external interference is protected by Section 176, Subsection 3, which guarantees that judges have financial security. Specifically, the salary, allowances, and benefit of judges may not be reduced. This ensures that judges do not fear reprisal in the form of salary cuts or the loss of benefits for making unpopular decisions, especially finding against officials from other branches of government. So it's very much important for you to go and uh, work as a judge because if it's 40,000 per month, it's 40,000 per month. No re reduction. <laughs> it's good. But lastly, although lower courts, uh, traditional courts have a lesser degree of independence than superior courts, the CC has held that this does not threaten the, pre the requisite threshold of judicial independence and impartiality since it is the function of the superior court, mostly through judicial review, to protect the impartiality of independence of lower courts. This was decided in the Van Royer. You should have written like this and get 15 marks. You have seen how it is. You should have written like that for 15 marks. Then you got it. Okay, so now...
Let's go to another question now. Let's go to another quishy quishy. So number question that is following uh, is to say define, okay, explain, okay, contrast, okay, evaluate, and the high ratio of the cost and the composition powers, responsibilities, and limits of the constitutional court, the Supreme Court of Appeal, the High Court, the Magistrate Court with regard to constitutional jurisdiction. Uh, now let's start to answer this question, you know. We are talking about the judicial system. We are starting with the high rich. Where the high rich? The court in South Africa, number one, we have the constitutional court, which is the biggest court, uh, which is the apex court in South Africa. Number two, we have the Supreme Court of Appeal. Number three, we have the High Court of South Africa, you know, with different divisions. Uh, number D, we have the magistrate courts, and then uh, the magistrate courts are called lower courts, and this one, one, two, three, are called high courts. Any other court established or recognized in terms of an act of parliament, including any court of status similar to either the high court of South Africa or magistrate courts, for the most part, attempts. Um, a to D above represent the high reach of South African courts. The high court may hear matters on, of, on appeal from the magistrate court, and the Supreme Court may hear matters on appeal from the high court. As stated above, the constitutional court is the highest court in this high reach. Uh, lower courts are bound by the decision of high, uh, high courts. Lower courts are bound by the decision of high court. We call it judicial precedent which we have studied very well in ILW. Do you remember ILW 1501? Of course, we have done something we call judicial independent, judicial precedent, where the lower courts are bound by the decision of high courts. That's what they are, they are talking about here when they say that uh, the high court must hear the appeal of magistrate and the Supreme Court of Appeal must hear the appeal of high court. So the decision that is taken here in the constitutional will bound this, 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 and this. And this one it will bound this and this. And this one will bound this. Therefore, if this this if you appeal the matter here and they decided the matter here, the Supreme Court of Appeal will not be bound by the, this, this decision. However, any decision that is taken here will be bound in here and here and here. So that's what we call judicial uh, precedence. And then while the magistrate courts and the various divisions of the high court only have a power to hear matters that arose within geographical boundaries, the Supreme Court of Appeal and Constitutional Court have jurisdiction across South Africa. The Supreme Court Act 23, 20, 20, 20, 2013 divides the High Court of South Africa into nine divisions. Don't, 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 be, don't, don't forget that this doesn't mean the Supreme Court of Appeal. Uh, so, uh, 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 this doesn't mean that the uh, uh, Supreme Court of Appeal. This means that the Superior Court Act, which means that is the court from High Court until the last one. Some divisions have multiple seats. One main seat, the main seat was jurisdiction over matters arising anywhere in the province. There are several specialists in High Courts created by the Acts of Parliament to deal with issues specific to that legislation. The creation of this court is in, envisaged in Section 166E of the Constitution. While these courts have a high reaching status of high courts, they, are exercise, they all exercise national jurisdiction. Number one, we have a labor court, labor court and Labor Court of Appeal, which is in Johannesburg. We know about this one, right? Yeah. <laughs> we know about the matters like a CCMA, all those things. Then we have the Land Claims Court in Rendbeck. We know about this one. Then we have the Competition Appeal Court, which is in Cape Town. I don't know about that one because I have never been to Cape Town. The, Electro the Electoral Court in Bloemfontein. Well, Electoral Court, I know about it because now we are heading to the uh, election. So there will be someone who is writing on the election day. No ways. There will be nobody. Then there's a tax court in Pretoria. This one I know about the tax court. I can even direct you if you want to go to the tax, tax court. 
um, right? But there's a Mnandi here because this there's something that I want you to write. You must state very clear that the Chief Justice is the head of the judiciary and ex exercises responsibilities responsibility over the establishment and monitoring of uh, norms and standards for the exercise of the judicial functions of all courts. The Chief Justice also presides over the Constitutional Court, the highest court in the Republic. Uh, you know that the Chief Justice now, the, Chief, that the former Chief Justice was Mukwin Mukwin, then now is a Jusondo, and, and now in, uh, in August, there's a good news, because in August, the first woman will become the Chief Justice, and that is Judge Maya. <laughs> Let's give a hand for that. Judge Maya is becoming the first Chief Justice in August. That is a remarkable. It's a turning point in the uh, gender equity. Yes. Since the question said that we must deal with constitutional jurisdiction, let's go to the constitutional jurisdiction. A court's power to hear argument in and pass judgment on a legal matter is known as its jurisdiction. And noted above, some courts, such as the various divisions of the High Court and Magistrate Court, have geographical determined jurisdiction. However, a court's jurisdiction is not determined by location alone. Subject matter is also an important aspect of jurisdiction. Magistrate courts, for example, do not have a jurisdiction over divorce matters or matters that involve the interpretation of a will and the interpretation of a statute, right? Not all courts have subject matter jurisdiction over constitutional issues. The 1993 interim constitution, which welded the constitutional court into the existing court system, placed the constitutional court in an equal position with the Supreme Court of Appeal. The, the SCA retains its position as the FBI, as the FBI final jurisdiction over all non-constitutional matters, but enjoyed no jurisdiction over constitutional matters. The final constitutional constitution changes this arrangement, empowering the SCA with constitutional jurisdiction. At this stage, the constitutional court had no general jurisdiction over non-constitutional matters. A third major, major change was brought about by the 17th Amendment to the Constitution in 2012. Since this amendment, the constitutional court has a jurisdiction not only over constitutional matters, but also over any other matter. If it grants leave to appeal the matter, leave to appeal is granted by the Constitutional Court. If the, court, the matter raises an arguable point of law of general public importance, which ought to be considered by court. Note that the arguable point of law a requirement excludes matters that involve disputes of fact. Similarly, the Constitutional Court may entertain matters involving the straightforward application of law. The Constitutional Court makes the final decision whether a matter is within its jurisdiction. Yes. Then, there are some subject matters upon which the Constitutional Court has exclusive jurisdiction. I hope when you are studying, a, what do you call it? Civil Procedure Act, you will learn about the exclusive jurisdiction. Civil Procedure Act, CIV 374. CIV 3701, uh, I'm sure, you know, Civil Procedure Act. In other words, no other court may hear or adjudicate upon matters of this nature. These are listed in Section 167, uh, Subsection 4 of the Constitution. The dispute between organs of state in the national or provincial sphere concerning the constitutional status, powers, or functions for any of those organs of state. Uh, this must have an exclusive jurisdiction. Matters concerning the constitutionality of any parliamentary or a provincial bill, where the bill has been referred to the Constitutional Court by the President in terms of Section 79 or Provincial Pro Premier. Sorry. Uh, yes. Application by members of the NPA or provincial legislature 
for an order declaring that certain legislation is unconstitutional. Matters concerning the constitutionality of any amendment to the constitution. These are the, the matters concerning the failure of parliament or the president to fulfill a constitutional obligation and the certification of provincial constitution in terms of section 144. These are the matters that the, the, the constitution has only exclusive. Exclusive. <laughs> it's only heard in the constitutional court when we talk about exclusive. In terms of the final constitution, the SCA has a jurisdiction of appeals in most arising from the High Court. This includes constitutional matters, whereas before the 17th Amendment, the Supreme Court of Appeal was the highest appeal court in South Africa in non-constitutional matters. The SCA may now be court of final instance in non-constitutional matters, where the constitutional court has decided not to hear the appeal on grounds of mentioned above. So this is very much important that... Uh, do, uh, before the 17th Amendment, it was the final instance. Remember, there's a court of first instance, there's a court of Q, then there's a final instance. You have done it when you were duly CSL or SJG, one of those, those modules. You have done it. Then we can't repeat what is the final instance, what is the court of first instance, because you have done it. Then it means that in the olden days, as Supreme Court of Appeal was the final instance in all non constitutional matters. Nowadays, it's not like that. It's only final where the constitutional court uh, in, in, uh, ensured that uh, we won't hear such a such a matter. Then as the question was also talking about the powers uh, of the courts. So we have to state the powers of the courts in constitutional matters. Uh, then they stated that uh, the constitutional matter includes any issue involving the interpretation, protection, or enforcement of the constitution. The fact that this provision uses the word includes means that the constitutional matters are not limited to this definition. The constitutional court has not been proactive in providing then these cases. Then there's the case of S. Visas Bozak, where the constitutional offers a uh, no definition of constitutional matters. Then there were, however, then there was the blah, blah, blah. This is the same things. Blah, 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 blah. With a most of the certain things. No. So, guys, I've answered this question because I have included everything uh, that you want uh, in the examination. If you need this document, don't forget, uh, you can WhatsApp me on 061 Please give me. But you must know nothing for Mahara is a national anthem. If you need more information about CSL, you can also uh, uh, contact me. But nothing for Mahara is a national anthem. It's a national. No, it's a general anthem, really. It's not. It's a, it's a general national anthem. Yeah. So, guys, let's see if I can answer another question or I may uh, answer in another video. Uh, I think that uh, on the other video, I will explain question number one, uh, which is 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3 in a way that you will understand. So today I was explaining about the uh, judicial independency and the constitutional court, the jurisdiction of the constitutional court, which I have explained. I explained the Supreme Court of Appeal. You have heard everything about uh, such a thing, which you must write in the examination. So it was very helpful, guys, to watch my videos. And I will come back with another video for CSL. I know that 15 May is your day. And I will make sure that you get everything you needed for 15 May. Okay, keep on reading, guys. I'll keep on uploading videos and keep on watching my videos because my videos are too much educational. Have a nice day. Lovely.